so you are aware <coughs> whatever is been uh, shown in this slide structured data that is called schema first semi structured that is schema later and unstructured that is schema never that is schema never there is a reason why this is been shown now and you also look at this uh, diagram which i have shown you in the very beginning from where we started this entire journey again we came back to the same diagram at the very lowest you have hdfs on the top you have data processing and on the top you have access management and finally you have data analytics business intelligence and analytic analytics tools that is the ultimate goal why we are storing is basically for the sake of data analytics only otherwise there is no point in storing the data the central theme of for storing the data is to have data analytics is to have data analytics now you look at that one closely if you analyze the entire map reduce job life cycle if you analyze the entire map reduce job life cycle tell me what are the phases involved here what are the phases involved what are the phases involved here flow yeah are you able to listen to me why there is not it's not coming yes sir one second you my my friends okay so you have your hdfs and then you have uh, input format input format from input format we have a uh, split split then we have a record reader record reader reads the records and gives the key value pairs to your map map then you have combiner then you have partitioner shuffle and sort 
reducer reducer writes the output to hdfs now in between what the output the map is map phase is going to or mapper phase is going to produce what the output your mapper phase is going to produce that is going to be served as an input to my combiner it produces some output that is going to be received by the partitioner it produces some output that is going to be received by your shuffle sort it produces some output that is actually received by the reducer finally reducer is going to write it to hdfs now you see here this is the output whatever you are seeing here this is what output whatever you are seeing here this part this part this part this part so all these outputs right and those will serve as an input to the next phase the output of the previous phase serves as an input to the next phase see these things if you understand closely you will understand because uh, technology is always technology is always an evolutionary process it is not that all of us are today you have a totally different and new technology in the industry that never has happened in the last uh, you know hundreds of years in the last hundreds of years there is no single day in the history that all of a sudden something uh, uh, you know uh, something sparked so it is all a part of the evolutionary process day before yesterday yesterday today based on the tomorrow the next day the next day it's not like that completely irrelevant and something has happened only today you will not find you will not find like that anything in the history it's all a part of the evolutionary process now you are saying something called spark and people are uh, widely talking about this one and everyone it, it's it's a buzzword now and it's not a, a new all of a sudden created technology it is a part of the evolutionary process it is a part of the evolutionary process so the if you look at this uh, this this whatever i am discussing now very closely you understand definitely what is the need for the next that if you understand the solution is spark solution is spark but before that we need to understand what is the need of next to map reduce that makes you to understand oh that is the reason spark is there and we are done so the output of the previous phase is going to serve as an input to my next phase having said that where this output is been stored <clears throat> where this output is been stored this is the input this is the input to my job this is the input to my job now what is the output from my job input to the job this is input to the job and this is the output from job this is input to the job and this is output from the job so in between see input to the job is coming from hdfs output from the job is also a uh, going to hdfs in between where this is getting stored
where this is getting stored, friends. You agree with me? You agree with me, friends? Yeah, sure. So if you look closely here, what all happening? The output of the map phase is written to the local file system. And uh, the output from the map phase, when it is being written to the local file system, one write, again one read. This is a, a read and write if you take. One write, one read, one, uh, one write and one read. Next phase, one write and one read. Next phase, one write and one read. Next phase, one write and one read. So here one, here one, here one, read and this write, this uh, write is going to be to HDFS. And here this read is from HDFS, leaving this one and this one, rest of all, against the local file system. So, so many times read and write in terms of uh, one map reduce job. One map reduce job undergoes these many uh, reads and writes. One map reduce job undergoes these many reads and writes. Now imagine, now imagine you have a DAG. Where we came across this one? Where we came across this one, friends? We came across this one as part of our Oh, the Uzi? Uzi, Uzi. Yeah, so we came across this DAG, right? Directed acyclical graph. It's called a directed acyclical graph. Directed acyclical graph. That is what DAG is. So if you look at this one closely, you have, you start from here, move over here, and from here, you move to this one, and you also move to this one, this is, uh, uh, I think my first, uh, or maybe I call this as A, this as B, this as C, and this probably has got my D and this is E. B and E put together my F and then G and then my stop or end. Assume. This is my start. You look at this one closely. It is not cyclical. Where we are starting, there we are not ending. If you are doing like that, then it is called cyclical. But this is a cyclical. And more specifically, this is a directed. This is a directed. This is a directed. I think you are noticing here. What do you mean by directed? A cyclical graph. 
at any point of time you see it will have only one one direction at any point of time you see here you will not uh, be having uh, two paths in the same start you see a b f g a c d e f g you look at this one closely is a directed one it has got uh, the direction how it is starting and how it is ending in a directed way this is what we call it to be diag now this is going to be my map produce job this is going to be my map produce job or this is may this may be a map produce job this may be pig this may be hive this may be scoop whatever all put together that so directly or indirectly let it be pig or hive or scoop anything ultimately they grill down to map produce now if one map produce job itself undergoes those many reads and writes in terms of diag how many read writes will be there how many read writes will be there and especially especially when it comes to machine learning when it comes to machine learning at least here if you observe closely data is different in each case in the case of a dag in the case of a dag if you see the input here and the output and all these things if you look closely maybe we may work on the same input or we may work on different inputs there is no there is no restriction or limitation in that way may have same input or different inputs but when it comes to the machine learning when it comes to the machine learning you will have same data in one perspective we process this one we get some output in the other perspective we process the same data we get some other output in the other perspective we process the same data we get a different output probably these two we merge and uh, these two you merge if you look closely here on the same data we are repeatedly processing on the same data set we are repeatedly processing probably with different uh, logic or something like that when the data set is the same when the data set is the same which is been read repeatedly and processed with different uh, uh, logic or business rules whatever it is if you look this uh, i mean look into this one very closely you understand data is the same but is expected to be processed in different different ways and in that case why i need to do reads multiple times from hdfs also why can't i read the data and preserve it somewhere so that i need not read repeatedly from hdfs i hope you are following with me friends what i am sharing all the scenarios i am i am explaining you so that you understand what are the limitations here what are the limitations here see the biggest limitation in terms of any processing is the io read any document friends this is the biggest limitation the reason behind that is in spite of uh, continuous improvements in improvements in io there exists always the bottleneck in terms of io because of the reason because of the reason the speed at which your processor is capable of processing the data at the same speed we will not be able to perform read or write operations because you do the processing with your processor 
with the memory local to the processor. I mean, you're using your CPU registers and your primary memory. At the same speed, if you try to read the data from the hard disk or write the data to the hard disk, if you move the read-write arm at that speed, because of the friction, sparks may arise and the hardware may get burnt. We cannot move the read-write arm at that speed. It is not possible. We cannot, we cannot read or write at that speed. That is the reason why there is always a wide gap between the uh, the level of processing we do with the processor and the and the level of uh, read or write operations that we we perform against your your hardware. Of course, these days slowly that gap is getting reduced because of introducing new types of memories. Slowly in the place of hard disk, we are getting uh, flash memories, solid state drives and all these things. Where you will not be using your mechanical aspects anymore. It's something like your RAM only. I think you are noticing these days even the laptops are coming equipped with uh, flash drives and your SSD, solid state drives and all. Of course, they are very expensive now. That is the reason why the hard drives are hardly 128 GB or you know 256 GB max, but still very, very expensive. You look into those, uh, those drives or look into those uh, laptops and all, they are very, very thin. They are very, very thin, almost like your, uh, uh, like your tab. So I am I'm talking about the thickness. Because earlier, we need uh, this uh, uh, CD drive. We need a hard drive. Because of the thickness of the hard drive and the CD drive, the laptop size used to be bulky. Slowly, hard drive need has gone. I mean, uh, a floppy, I mean, the CD drive need has gone, so the thickness came down, but still because of the hard disk and all, still that thickness was there. But now because the advent of these SSDs and flash memories, even for your secondary storage, now the thickness of your bottom part of the laptop, you see, it's almost uh, close to your uh, tab kind of thing. Of course, they are expensive at this stage. In the coming days, as the technology is getting improved, sure, uh, you know, at what price we are getting the uh, hard, hard disk drives now, almost the same price we will get uh, even SSDs and your flash memories and all. Even then, there is always uh, a gap between your ability to process the data and the ability to read or write the data read or write the data. So, I.O. is always a challenge or a bottleneck. In any, any uh, job execution, I.O. plays a very critical role. Now, keeping all these things in the mind, look at this diagram and tell me, friends, what you understand. From this diagram, if you are able to understand something, yes, I, I, I mean, I can confidently say that, yes, you are on the track of Understanding the concepts. Look at this diagram and tell me what is your, your observation and what is your conclusion. Data data processing. Uh, from, from the input to the uh, the other uh, uh, output file. So immediately is the Spark. Spark is uh, just processing the uh, um, the input data to the output layer. Okay. Anything anything better than that? Uh, I see 
three was here in the second one in the Spark uh, is basically an in-memory process compared to the one uh, in uh, MapReduce. Uh, Okay, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. This is entire diagram for Spark. You understand this diagram? Think that you have understood Spark. And the only thing that we need to understand beyond this diagram is how that is being implemented. That is the only thing we need to understand. For that sake, we have libraries and all. And we work with those things. So forget about their execution and their uh, the, the way you write the code and all. The way you write the code and all. But if you look at this diagram, that is what I told you just now. Especially when you come to the machine learning, you have a sequence or a series of MapReduce jobs. Or iteratively we are going to work. What are the output you get in a DAG if you see closely? The output of a one MapReduce job in a DAG if you observe closely is nothing but one MapReduce job and uh, its output is consumed by one more MapReduce job. And it produces some output and that is uh, consumed by the next MapReduce job. But if you observe closely at every level, you are writing it to HDFS. I told you very clearly. That is the reason why we are compelled to discuss all these things. Input coming from HDFS, output going to HDFS. That is why I stressed on that point. Every MapReduce job takes the input from HDFS, writes the output to HDFS. You know very well, anything that is written to HDFS is uh, is always under the influence of your you agree with my point friends anything that you write to hdfs undergoes a replication right of factor 3 or 2 whatever but by default the replication factor is 3 Anything that you write to HDFS undergoes a replication. Not only writing to HDFS and its replication, how much painful it will be at your job level, you understand, friends. That is why we need to start seeing MapReduce with a very effective magnifying glass. With a very effective magnifying glass, if you look into MapReduce, each phase happening, you will understand where you are losing the performance. That if you are able to overcome, definitely uh, it is going to be very efficient. That is what is done in Spark, nothing more than that. You see here, the input in a DAG, in a DAG, you read from HDFS, you write to HDFS, you read from HDFS, you write to HDFS, you read from HDFS, you write to HDFS. Instead, you only read from HDFS one time and all the intermediate data in terms of a DAG, if you are able to store it in your memory itself, there exists only one read and one write and rest of all is going to be in the memory itself so that you can avoid this writing and the replication all that thing and uh, you can imagine what is going to be the efficiency of your process and that is what your spark is doing nothing more what your spark is doing it is doing your in-memory computing the output of uh, one job, the output of one job, and more specifically, more specifically, within the job also there is intermediate data, that also will not be persisted to the local file system. That also will be, that also will be 
uh, stored in your primary memory itself. Now, as a result, I need not tell you, these applications are memory intensive and CPU intensive applications. I need not tell you that. Spark based applications are always memory intensive and uh, CPU intensive. And you need to be prepared for that. At the cost of your CPU and memory, uh, the performance what you get is acceptable, but is not suitable for every kind of processing. Your Spark is not a suitable candidate for every kind of processing. It is suitable only in the limited uh, context, not every context. Mm -hmm. Keeping in the mind that it is more efficient, we cannot apply. We cannot apply. So you mean uh, for uh, real-time processing and other stuff, uh, is it recommended? Uh, exactly. For real-time processing, it is definitely recommended. Say, for example, for the credit card fraud detection kind of thing, you require definitely in-memory computing than your batch processing. But for historical data analysis, why you require Spark? You want to analyze the last 30 years data. For that sake, why you require Spark? You happily run a DAG, you happily run a Uzi workflow. You finally get the output. And you know, you, uh, you analyze that one. Whatever you want, you do it. Even if it takes 5, 6 hours or 10 hours or a day or two, no problem. We are, we are working on the historical data. But when we are working on the transactional data, and which plays a very critical and a crucial role, I mean, you identify the fraud on your credit card after the transaction is over. What is the point? There is no point in identifying the fraud on your card after the transaction is over. That is, of course, that is definitely helpful in analyzing, but the goal is to stop that fraud, right? To stop the disaster. Now you are getting the data from weather stations, and after the tsunami has happened, you process the data and you say that yes, possibility of tsunami, tsunami in the next six hours. What is the point after the disaster has happened? So, depending on the need, not every case, wherever processing is there, we don't apply Spark. That is what I want to make it clear to you. Don't think that it is giving you in-memory computing or processing capabilities. And as a result, every, every job execution we do with Spark. No. Why I am saying that one is to make you to understand Spark is not the replacement to your MapReduce. That is why I am stressing on that point. What most of the time people are thinking, now Spark came, MapReduce is gone. That is what most people think. It is not that Spark came and MapReduce is gone. Spark has got its own use cases and MapReduce has got its own use cases. Both going to coexist. One is not the replacement to the other. That I want to make it very clear to you. What kind of problems you are interested to solve using Spark? Uh, you will be doing it with Spark. Other things we can happily get it done using your traditional batch processing using your MapReduce directly or indirectly through Pig Hive Scoop and all. Right? So this diagram, you please look at this diagram, like how you have uh, something called, you know, maybe a dot you keep and start focusing on that. That is what people call it as meditation. Focusing your mind on one thing is called meditation, basically. Nothing more than that. Focusing on one single, that could be a point or that it be some image or whatever it is. Now, if you look at this diagram also in a similar way, 
you get everything about spark friends you get everything about spark and within the within the job also within the job also one thing is we are avoiding hdfs rights and thereby you are avoiding replications and all that related stuff that is fine within the job also if uh, data needs to be spilled to the external storage that is all been taken care of compensated through your main memory only though it is expensive in terms of memory and cpu but at that pain the uh, the performance what we are able to gain is remarkable are you able to understand this one friends it's not my intention to compare the lines of code and praise a uh, uh, spark or something like that that's not my intention but if you look at that one closely the same word count program the same word count program what you have in your uh, the same word count program what you see in your map reduce then in your peak then in your hive and finally you see the same map reduce word count program look at this one this is your word count program look at the code three lines done your word count is done whatever we achieved through map reduce then through your peak then through your high and all all been replaced with uh, those three lines of code out of which uh, one line is to read the data that is uh, get the data or get the reference to that file that text file dot flat map where line dot split where are spaces there that is going to return you the tokens and those tokens are been mapped with uh, each word and the numerical value one and then you are reducing by key and the output is been stored to hdfs again if you take out reading from hdfs and writing it or saving it to hdfs in between there is only one line of code with one line of code you are able to achieve your map the same word count map reduce what output you get same output you get from here so what you understand from this one friends this is what the code you have looking at the code what you understand what is your observation or perspective yeah ram prasad hemal what do you understand from this one it is can't it be something like this it is a different level of abstraction on the top of map reduce see ultimately what processing i mean your massive parallelism that all remains same but the way things though it is looking like this one here in the background it should work that way only 
but only thing is within that uh, job also within that job also each output you get that is actually been persisted to your storage and from there we are going to read it. Are you able to understand this one friends? One other point that you need to get here is the richness of the library what you have as part of a, a scale the richness of the libraries what you have as part of your Scala, which is a layer on the top of your Java. Scala is a layer on the top of Java. It is a layer on the top of Java, or uh, uh, Scala embeds Java. So, with the richness of the libraries specially developed for massive parallelism, your life becomes more comfortable and it, it's, it's more efficient in terms of working with your data sets. Now the beauty part here is, the beauty part here is, your entire Spark works with the concept of RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set Concept, RDD. This is actually a, a research project by a team, which they developed as part of their uh, research work uh, and later on, this has taken the shape called a Spark Framework. But it is actually, it is actually, uh, you know, the proposal. I mean, it's a kind of uh, uh, research work done by a team uh, to improve the efficiency of your, uh, you know, execution. And that itself has taken the shape of uh, a different framework called uh, Spark. Spark framework. If you look at this one, its execution aspect is going to remain the same. You have a driver program, which the driver program is nothing but the code with which you are going to drive. That is called driver program. So driver program with the help of a Spark context, interact with the cluster manager, get the resources to execute your task. And as a result, you are able to run your code comfortably on the cluster. It was. Yeah. It was, I have a question. Please, please, please. Yeah. So, um, I'm just uh, confused, like, uh, actually, on the basic side, like, what is Spark? Is it a, like a framework or is it a language or a scripting? Uh -huh. How? How I did this spark is what? Good, 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 good. Let me show you that. So look at this one closely. Apache Spark is a library. Apache Spark is a framework. Apache Spark is just a computing framework, nothing related to storage. You can see that one here. Apache Spark, if you go there, is a fast and general engine for large-scale data processing, that's it. And they mentioned here, run programs up to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce in memory or 10 times faster on disk. 10 times faster on disk. What is that... Uh, Hadoop uh, MapReduce in memory or 10 times faster on disk is, say for example, if it is a case of a, a DAG like this, then you will be seeing a more difference in terms of the performance. But if it is only a one job, if it is only a one job, one MapReduce job, only that local, local spilling or uh, local storage, only this is been avoided. Only that local storage is been avoided. Only that is been avoided. In, case, in the case of one map reduce job. But if you have a DAG, you will see more performance difference. Because lots and lots of read writes being avoided. And uh, only one read and one write uh, 
in terms of HDFS, so no replications, all those things been avoided very, very plainly and very clearly as a result. That is the reason why they mentioned here up to people mistake with this. Run programs up to 100 times faster, not every time. Not every time. Not every time. Ease of use because uh, we can write uh, applications quickly in Java, Scala, Python, R, different, different. And we have uh, the libraries available for Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, Machine Learning Library that is called MLLib, and for a graph kind of database, I mean, data processing. We have libraries specific to that. That is where we have, originally we have only Apache Spark, we don't have anything. Later on, that became the core engine, and on the top of that, uh, the other things been formulated. So you have Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, MLLib, GraphX, and all these things. So all I say, all I say, Spark is just a data processing engine. That's it. Processing engine. That is the reason why Spark runs on Hadoop. What do you mean by Spark runs on Hadoop? What do you mean by Spark runs on Hadoop? Spark runs on the data present as part of your Hadoop. That is your, your HDFS. So your storage is going to be HDFS. That's where your Spark can sit on. It can sit on, uh, uh, on your existing HDFS. Mesos is a kind of storage. Standalone or in the cloud. It can access diverse data sources including HDFS. Cassandra, HBase, and S3. Because, like how we are saying here, spark.txt file. Spark.txt file. Let me go to... Anything. Anything is... Uh, anything is fine. But let me show you. Or it will be easy for you to go through the Java API rather than Scala API. One moment, friends.
you have the method called uh, that is what one second spark context uh, i would like to show you that method Spark context only that is there you have uh, Hadoop, uh, Make, RDD, Paralyze, yes, T, 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 T. Yes. You see here. Reads a text file from HDFS. Reads, uh, that is under your Spark context only. Reads a text file from HDFS. A local file system available on all nodes. Or any supported, I mean Hadoop supported uh, file system URI. And written it as RDD of strings. So you see, for most methods, what you are seeing here. The return type is going to be an RDD. That is called resilient distributed data set. We talk about it. Don't worry. Don't break your head now. So, how you are able to read the data from a text file from different sources? We have the provision to read the data. Uh, from different sources, we have the provision to read the data. That is what it says here. You can run Spark using its standalone cluster mode on EC2 or Hadoop Yarn or on Mesos. Access data in HDFS, Cassandra, HBase, I, Tachyon. Tachyon is a kind of data storage again. Um, Isilion also we have. All these are the data storage techniques or uh, you know the, the way in which you store the data and read it effectively. So all these are storage techniques, HBase also a storage technique, Hadoop database that is called. So how you have the methods to access the data from a text file using spark context dot text file, same like we have the convenient libraries available to read the data from different sources. So for that sake, we need not worry. The only thing is after reading the data, how efficiently we process the data. If you are able to efficiently process the data, then you are done. Then you are done. So that is the reason why you look at this one, you understand. From this particular diagram, you see here, instead of we doing it against your local file system, or HDFS, we are doing it against your primary memory. As a result, the performance is going to drastically improve. The performance is going to drastically improve. But at the cost of, at the cost of, performance no doubt improves, but at the cost of, your CPU and mem uh, your memory, it's not like your MapReduce where the tasks are going to run on the respective nodes and then the aggregation, then uh, uh, I mean local aggregation, then your partitioner, shuffle sort, and then reducer. So are you getting the point here, friends? Are you getting the core idea behind? Because this being a totally different subject or a course which needs to be learned independently but I am trying my best to give you the feel why basically you are going to spark that if you are able to understand 
we may upgrade our skill set at the later stage but we need to first understand what this is and what problem it is going to address that is the reason why we are seeing what is a problem and how those problems can be addressed that is the reason why i am saying this is a part of the evolutionary process the part of the evolutionary process it is not that all of a sudden you got it now look into the same diagram now look into the same diagram resource virtualization can be done with your mesos or adupian storage can be on any of these things processing engine is going to be spark core on the top of that spark streaming spark sql and on the top you have other things also been built spark r graphics splash ml lib ml uh, pipelines ml base like how you have your uh, hadoop database like ml base so you see this one this is going to work only as a processing engine it is not a storage or any other thing it is just a processing engine which can be set up as standalone or in relation with uh, uh, with with your other uh, services so spark core initially there is no such thing called spark core it is just spark all period of time what happened so as performance is needed everywhere as part of the ecosystem so all the components are been built rebuilt on the top of this uh, uh, distributed computing framework called processing engine or spark core and you have your other specific libraries will build but all these in the context of your processing only nothing related to storage spark is no related to storage so spark is just a framework uh, with which uh, your other things have been built you got the point ram right? i don't know who raised this point spark is it uh, uh, what it is basically it is basically a, a framework a software framework only for processing not for any other yeah i got that uh, prasad yeah prasad so using this uh, library or a bit of time again evolutionary process only see initially i developed map reduce i started using it when i started using it i realized it is not suitable for every kind of requirement when when i have a different requirement what needs to be done so that made me to develop a, a spark engine and i started using spark engine then i realized my high queries are been suffered or my querying is been suffered so how i can refine it then i understood instead of me directly working with the, the querying of the data on the hdfs better i get it through my spark engine so that my querying also going to be efficient that is where i developed something called spark sql same like for your machine learning i just before i said to you what is machine learning machine learning is is making the machine uh, uh, to work on its own with the artificial intelligence it gains over a period of time so that is what the machine learning is so machine learning is a kind of uh, ai artificial intelligence and uh, your processing ability and your storage ability a, a, a mixture of everything mixture of everything machine learning all these are the ingredients for your machine learning so in the machine learning what we do is we use the same data and we recursively process in different contexts and we need to do that at a lightning speed we cannot uh, do that that is where you know machine learning you see your uh, uh, cell i mean driverless cars and all what you are seeing these days all the result of your machine learning all the result of your machine learning right see it gets inputs from different sources and those needs to be dynamically like a, almost like on the fly processing so that we can make the quick decision object has been identified you apply the brakes after it has been hitted 
What is the point of applying the brakes? Or what is the point of you receiving the information? But being processed only after the damage has happened. That is where you need Spark. Spark, Spark kind of computing is more essential in the context where in the context where you are trying to analyze your transactional data or something that is coming into your box and which is expected to be processed even before being stored on uh, your storage. Even before it is being stored on the storage. When that kind of situation arises, then only we go with Spark. Otherwise, we can comfortably go with your MapReduce uh, with the help of your batch processing. Yes, can be done comfortably. For that sake, every requirement need not land up in the Spark only. Right? So with this, we have understood Spark is a distributed computing framework. Is a computing framework. And on the top of that, other uh, uh, sub-libraries have been built for SQL, for streaming, for machine learning, for uh, graph kind of uh, data processing. So you have specific libraries with which you are going to uh, you are going to develop your context, contextual, uh, you know, applications, but all built on the top of the same foundation called Spark Core. As part of the Spark Core, we come across one essential element or essential uh, topic or a concept called RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. Resilient distributed data set. What it what exactly it means? Let us have a look at that. Srinivas uh, one question. Yeah please please. So uh, so understood like a uh, Spark is a uh, like a, a distributed process engine. Like um, mm. um on the top of like you mentioned that Spark SQL uh, Spark streaming and all these are the plugins uh, for the Spark not plugins, like not plugins. plugins. These are so these are specific frameworks on the top of core uh, to work in the uh, specific context. So uh, let's say an example like a Spark SQL. Um, so we have a, a output uh, on the uh, pro Spark processing. Yeah. On the output, uh, we are going to use this SQL to um, do some. Um, I'm, I'm not getting like a, what what is the SQL Spark SQL do? The Spark SQL will not do anything. It is a hive built on the Spark, nothing more than that. Oh, okay, similar to the hive. Not similar. It is a hive built on the Spark, nothing more than. Okay. That. You go to hive. You go to hive. I don't know. Um, whether you have uh, gone through this any time or not. Now Spark on YAN service, you see, this Hive service-wide is on Spark. This is on Spark. So when querying is going to be done using Spark, when querying is going to be done using your Spark, obviously more efficient, right? Yeah. Okay, you are querying the high query on the Spark framework. Exactly. So as a result, what happens? Yeah, it's going to be more efficient, like faster. That's it, that's it. That, that's where all these things are coming into picture. Let me show you let me show you what you do with your uh, uh, SQL stuff and all. Uh, Spark. Uh, I'll show you. See ya. Don't worry for other things. I think because you know Java comfortably, that is where I, I can see the, I can show you this one directly to make you to understand. 
hive context is the spark context that sc is called spark context okay it is all the context concept i don't know uh, whether you recorrect or not you have servlet context yeah it's similar to that yeah yeah what is a servlet context it is the same philosophy now i think you you have understood your map reduce version 1 is all based on your output collector your output collector and your error handling a separate thing there is a separate provision to collect the output and a separate provision to log the mess i mean what all the errors that happens or something happen during your execution if that needs to be shared with the external world there is a separate provision both are been merged in the new framework with the context object there is a map context object there is a reduce context object so the the same context concept what you are enjoying all the years same even when you come to spark we have a spark context okay that the spark context is encapsulated inside your hive context using that hive context if you run the query context dot sql and you give the query it is going to take the uh, leverage of uh, your spark libraries to execute that query and get the data i think you got the point what i am sharing Yeah, Shivas. So, Shivas, uh, is it like instead of applying the, I mean, instead of using the uh, SDFs uh, storage, it will use the uh, Spark? Uh, oh no, 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 no. Uh, you are you are mistaken again. No, it's storage will be SDFs like. only. No, storage will be SDFs only. I mean, the processing in in for when it is processing the hive. Uh, input and as you said the all the intermediate steps like doing the yes. input and output all instead of time. instead of we using map reduce to uh, process your data present on hdfs now i use a spark library to process the same data on hdfs as a result the efficiency will be very high see it is the same data that is present on your hdfs there is no there is no alternative for that look at this diagram but as you said the reads and writes in between uh, exactly. that is that that it has to do exactly that, that earlier it. yeah that earlier it used to do on the sdfs itself now this is going to do the uh, spark is going to do it in memory and make it faster that's what you say right absolutely right no other thing that is the reason why i say It is, it is the beauty part is not using the library here. I mean, the the understanding is, if you understand this one thoroughly, this one thoroughly, you can easily understand. Oh, these are the limitations we have here. Oh, fine, those limitations are being overcome in the Spark. That's it. Or that is why. learning a new technology where that is where i say the perspective difference this is called what most of the time people are crazy they are crazy about learning new things people are more crazy about learning new things each time but i say be more clear and specific on existing then you automatically understand not only new things you also can forecast what is going to come in future you may not be able to develop that one you may not be uh, capable of developing that one but you can forecast oh in the coming days definitely there should be a solution like this you may not have the ability to develop that and give it to the uh, industry but you can forecast that is all possible only 
when you study the existing thoroughly then you understand what can come in future even if something comes in future that you can easily understand or tell me what is the best em either learning spark you know on its own is best or learn map produce thoroughly understand every minute detail of map produce to understand spark which is better understand going with the basics is always good yeah that is the reason why i said i don't know personally see i, I, don't, i don't have any right to criticize anyone it is it is all up to their individual perspective and there but i i am i am going very technically and logically here i am not trying to convince you in any way instead of you taking the pain of learning something uh, uh, you know uh, in a different dimension uh, it is always a wonder to me how come people are able to learn spark directly they don't know about massive parallelism they don't know about uh, uh, you know Uh, how data has been crunched so efficiently on the hadoop cluster without knowing all those things how can we understand and appreciate spark we understand and appreciate spark only when we understand map produce thoroughly and identify the bottlenecks there then we understand uh, oh these bottlenecks are been addressed or how these bottlenecks can be addressed when that question arises the answer i say these bottlenecks are addressed in this way using spark then you understand all oh, then you can if you go into the code now i think i don't know whether you got this code or not see it is a same query right which you are working with your high walls earlier select a star from people whatever now also it is the same query but how you are doing that one you are doing that one by using the hive context encapsulated with spark context and run that query so that it is going to be efficient i am saying and how you can confirm that and how you can understand and feel the thrill only when you understand the importance of spark only you, uh, then you i mean you you get that feel ah oh, my map producer has got these limitations don't say don't call them as drawbacks limitations i say there is a lot of difference between drawbacks and limitations this is not a drawback this is a limitation and those limitations are been overcome using your and as uh, spark is not uh, specific to hdf so we can uh, use outside of the ah, audio that is the reason so that like is Exactly. Required an input files. Yes. And to process this, this uh, some items. So, like part. how, like how I have shown you here, like how I have shown you here, using Spark context, we are able to read the data from HDFS. See here, read text file from HDFS. Not only from HDFS, you also can read the data from a different uh, this thing. Ah, uh, Cassandra, HBase. Now we have observed how it has been done in Hive. What is done done in Hive? What is done in Hive just now? How you can read the data from Hive by encapsulating your Spark context inside Hive context? I will be able to uh, work with my uh, Spark comfortably. you got the point yeah yeah so all the beauty part the, the, that is where i say see instead of we spending more time in understanding spark i advise you to spend more time in thoroughly understanding map produce and the more you identify the limitations the more you visualize those limitations you understand oh most of those limitations definitely need to be addressed if been addressed there should be a solution and there should be a name to that solution that is called your spark nothing more than that nothing more than that and then only 
that is how we mature the skill set uh, I, i tell you one thing i ask you one thing uh, very fairly here friends now i mean i'm not degrading don't mistake me and please it's not my intention to ask a question in that way you are fortunate that you know you are getting a chance to get the training from me tell me where i need to go and undergo the training the moment a new thing uh, comes into the market and we have been updated it is all because one reason one we are a part of this evolutionary process reason two the fundamentals are exceptionally strong that those are the only two reasons no other no other as we are a part of this evolutionary process it is just the delta that we are making up in the new thing it is the delta that we are making up in the new thing so that will and it doesn't need anything maybe a small discussion is sufficient to understand the whole big thing that is the reason why i request you friends to make your make your uh, you know learning ability in a different style and make your uh, learning uh, process in a different style at least now and immediately you ad- when you adopt that learning ability you be a part of this evolutionary process then you automatically it is something like standing in a queue line for uh, uh, balaji darshan in tirupati your job is over automatically people will push you and take you to the uh, lord balaji and you can g- get your darshan done you need not even walk people from back they always push you so that you will be moved uh, till the last but only thing is you need to uh, take the pain of going and standing in that line that's it or people automatically will push you so when you are a part of this evolutionary process you automatically will get updated here and there you will automatically get updated and that is the reason why i say before you learn any advanced thing you need to be fundamentally strong with your with your uh, core or the basic stuff then all your future learning process will not be impacted otherwise a small impurity at your basic level will hunt you throughout your career the more your basics and your fundamentals are strong your journey is going to be very smooth and uh, all these libraries maybe people the external world may feel thrilled looking at uh, i know the spark library uh, what uh, matai jaharia proposed as part of his research work uh, people may feel thrilled but people who are a part of the evolutionary process they understand oh as he was able to thoroughly understand the limitations of this one how those limitations can be overcome he has proposed that is how you got this spark framework or the spark library spark uh, document by i'll show you that one you see this this is the this is the actual document that is been published by the c here this is actually a part of their research work this team proposed that cluster computing with working sets whatever this is actually a thesis a paper that has been published by them every diagram everything that you see as part of that one the concept of rdd all been extracted from this document only this is original document that is published by this team as part of their research work and that has taken uh, the base this only this only the, uh, the 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 theoretical stuff that they proposed and the practical implementation for that is what you are seeing as part of your uh, apache i mean uh, spark.apache.org and you see this rdd concept a resilient distributed data set is a read only collection of objects partitioned across set of machines that can be rebuilt if the partition is lost the beauty part 
if this statement if you are able to read and understand thoroughly you are done with rdd concept also so rdd is nothing but rdd is nothing but if you understand rdd most of the because all the operations that you see inside your inside your library wherever you see here you all will come across rdd 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 only wherever you see here rdd all related to rdd only your entire spark revolves around that concept that if you are able to understand you are done most of the stuff with uh, uh, spark let us uh, study this rdd in a different style dd is called distributed distributed data set distributed also you take out we only talk about data set what do you mean by data set what do you mean by data set I think you know I'm making you to feel more tense or something like. <laughs> Not really. So a data set is just nothing but a file on the storage, right? That is what we have learnt all these days. A file on the storage. That is what we call it to be. That is what we call it to be. A data set. this file on the storage when it is been loaded when it is been loaded into memory will it be possible that you load into the memory of one cpu please please uh, friends respond is it possible that you load this data set into uh, the cpu of one machine i um, mean uh, um, the memory of one machine no we definitely need uh, multiple cpus or we need a okay. gpu like you know, which will do a better job i mean multiple uh, machines right multiple nodes or machines we need why because we are essentially talking in the context of big data when we are talking in the context of big data your files on the storage are not small files usually they run into tbs or more usually may not be every time there may be files of 500 gb or 800 gb or 2 tb something like that but we are when we are talking about big data we are not talking about 2 mb files 5 mb files 100 mb files you agree with me now a 2 tb file can you load it into one one uh, one 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 uh, node memory a 2 tb data set can we load into one memory i mean one memory in the sense like one machine memory M memory in the sense i'm talking about ram i'm not talking about your hard disk i'm talking about ram not possible to load this 2 tb data set in one ram so what is required this 2 tb data set is now divided into parts whenever you are dividing you always divide uniformly you are not going to divide like one 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 piece into 100 gb another piece into 2 gb we never divide like that it because it becomes tough for you to manage what needs to be done when you are dividing we always divide uniformly so dividing this 2 tb data set uniformly and load it into different machines results me distributed data set i think you got my point friends how my data set is becoming distributed data set now data set is no more centralized it is a distributed data set now this 2 tb is uniformly divided and stored on different rams now 
using this i start processing using this i start processing using this i start processing now for some reason one second friends one second so using this you start processing when you are doing the processing of the data loaded in your memory for some reason imagine this the the node on which this particular uh, part of the distributed data set is loaded this is lost assume this is lost are you going to reconstruct that uh, the entire uh, uh, distributed data set once again how much painful it is going to be and of course this is okay here but you take the scenario you take the scenario using this distributed data set you applied one algorithm and uh, you got some output again that is also a distributed data set now using this one you applied one more algorithm and uh, you got some other output okay like this now using this uh, i mean this is first one this is loaded second one this is third one now now after this is over after this is, this stage is over you are processing the same uh, initial loaded data set with a different algorithm this is algorithm 1 2 and algorithm 3 you want to process the same data with algorithm 3 you want to get some output finally you want these two to be processed together assume if that is the need by the time you are processing this one for some reason this is been gone this particular portion is gone or when you are processing this one this is gone assume you think is possible that you do it again from the scratch please friends try to follow this one uh, i mean we can do it but that would not be a best approach we we can do that one but each time each time each time when you are doing it from scratch you are been thrown out right you you start from the beginning again and that is definitely not a feasible approach because of out of a uh, out of thousands of uh, distributed data sets one is missing as a result again and again you are building the distributed data set you never can finish your job execution that is why they develop the distributed data set in such a way if any partition is been lost only that is been rebuilt because every partition will have sufficient information how that is been built if that is been lost only that is reproduced not the entire distributed data set that concept is what we call it to be resilient resilient the term called resilient is uh, is that thing only i think you are following with me what i am trying to share with you are this r resilient distributed data set what that r indicates resilient now go back to this uh, document and uh, see that here you will be definitely understanding is a read only collection of objects partition across set of machines that can be rebuilt that can be rebuilt if a partition is lost that is why we are calling this as a resilient resilient distributed data set because every partition will have a sufficient information about how that partition has been formed from where that partition has been formed something goes wrong with that only that portion is going to be regenerated is something like uh, 
I don't know whether you have seen that or not. Uh, you see some animated movies related robots and all. If some part has been lost, only that part has been fixed. Again, it starts functioning. Only some that part has been lost. Only that part has been fixed. Uh, again, it starts functioning as usual. You are you are getting my point. What I am saying here. The elements of RDD need not exist in physical storage. Instead, handle to a RDD contains enough information to compute the RDD starting from data in a reliable storage. This means the RDDs can always be reconstructed if nodes are going to fail. Now I think you are able to understand, friends, how fault tolerance is achieved at your HDFS, how fault tolerance is achieved using your Spark. Fault tolerance is achieved in Spark with the concept of RDD, resilient distributed data set. Even in the event, even in the event of your node failure, still your RDDs are going to persist because the same RDD can be replicated on a different node because we have the complete information how this uh, uh, RDD is being built or how a particular uh, partition of the RDD is being built. And it looks to be theoretical, friends. I mean, don't worry. All these are the concepts. And taking care of doing, we are not building the framework here. What you need to understand is we are not building the framework here. We are trying to use the framework here. In order to use the framework, we require some concept. That is what we are understanding. We, we need to understand oh, how they might have developed that one. When something goes wrong, how it is understanding and replicating or regenerating that one. That is not our headache. That is all been taken care of by the framework. That is the reason why we are using Spark framework. Otherwise, we ourselves can build that framework and use it, right? So we are not worried how that is being regenerated. That is all been taken care of by the framework. We only need to understand this framework has got the ability to regenerate that. That's it. And how it is being done internally is not our headache. And we don't need that also as a developer. We only need whether that uh, regeneration is happening or not. That's it. Are you able to understand this one, friends? And apart from this one, we also need to understand one more thing as part of this Spark. That is, Spark has got two aspects. One, the actions that we do and the transformations that we perform. Let me using Spark, what is that we do? It is the same old story again. You are how you write the code and how that is getting executed and all. If you see the same old story of your uh, uh, earlier thing, what we have studied, how you have your uh, job tracker and the task tracker and the, under the task tracker you have your uh, task running. Same like under the Spark context. At each node we have the uh, we have the executor JVM under which your tasks are going to function. All these are the tasks running under the control of your Spark context. So we need not worry for that one. So Srinivas, uh, if you go to the previous slide, the executor JVM 1 and 2, is that uh, similar to uh, multi-threading stuff, like uh, two threads are spawn? No, no, no. no. Is it not in memory well, yeah. stuff? Yeah, something similar to that one. Something similar to that one. Okay. Yes. The same like your task writer. Okay. Uh, I have a question here uh, regarding Spark. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. If we have like very huge data, let's say we're talking about like uh, petabytes of data, hmm. then uh, still, do you think uh, Spark? Uh, no, 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 no. Does... no, no. That is where that is where uh, uh, Ram. I say Spark is not the suitable candidate for everything. And you want to process the data, then you will be working only with the batch mode using MapReduce only. That is where you see. We will not be able to load that much data into your memory, right? Say so you have a... Temp what is the very nature of uh, big data, right? Like in uh, the big data, the data sets, like whenever we have huge. So you mean like we have to be selective whenever uh, we have real-time uh, scenario, real-time data okay. scenario with like the credit card and other stuff you said, plus the data should be optimal to... Exactly. To be, uh, yeah. So... All, that is where that is where most of the times I mean people why 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 and how we were able to conclude like that is because you see if that is the case then Spark should be the replacement for uh, MapReduce even after Spark been introduced to the industry still why MapReduce is there even now you go to I mean you do any you take up any job description and all. Even now they ask for the, along with Spark, they, they expect you to be good at uh, MapReduce. Maybe a specific organization may be interested to use only Spark. They don't need MapReduce at all. That is fine. But most, most, uh, you know, implementations you see, these two are, that is the reason why both are going to coexist on the same cluster. If one is a replacement to the other, by this time MapReduce has been washed out. And in the place of MapReduce, we only got, we only got, might have got, uh, uh, you know, Spark only. But that didn't happen for the reason. This is not a replacement. And moreover, as you rightly said, when you have petabytes of data, when you have petabytes of data, still can we use, uh, I mean, petabytes of data sets. You may have petabytes of data on the cluster, but in terms of a specific type of data, even that data is running into petabytes. When you are working on those data sets which are running into petabytes, can we still use Spark? And again, the answer is yes and no. That depends on your cluster resources and that depends on your need. The answer is yes if you have enough resources. The answer is no. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, in the context of uh, that one, you, you need not go with Spark. You can happily go with uh, MapReduce and get your things done. That all depends. So that is where I say Spark is not the suitable candidate for every uh, requirement that you come across in the big data context. Most jobs, even today, they work in the batch mode, even today. Because the one core goal of a SPA, I mean your uh, Hadoop cluster is all your last 20, 30, 40 years data, instead of you keeping on the tape drives in the library, you can offer it to your Hadoop cluster. So what is the advantage? Data is live, accessible to you, 24 bar 7. You can make your jobs to run on the data, let it be batch or whatever it is. But still the data is accessible to you, right, at your fingertip. So if you analyze all the historical data, that itself is a huge mine for you. Analyzing the historical data itself, see, last 20 years, your customer patterns and, uh, um, you know, behaviors and all you want to analyze so that you can design some good, even you take the concept of a bank. I give you a classical example. What is the advantage of analyzing your historical data. <clears throat> Last 30 years of your customer data, if you churn, if you churn your last 30 years data, in terms of a bank I'm talking, we will be able to come to know what is the, what is the mindset of the, how the mindset of customers getting changed. Mindset of customers getting changed. I mean, the minimum balance, minimum balance in a specific type of account is uh, 
assume thousand rupees that is been kept. When this decision is being changed, the minimum balance uh, for this particular account is uh, made it as five thousand. How the customers got dropped, or how the customer base got dropped, okay, or how many customers I was able to convert. All these things, if I analyze, this is one thing. And second thing, this is the story that has happened between 1930 and 50. Now 1950 and 80, similar kind of thing has happened, but that time there was no much traction. People were able to easily, oh fine, I'm getting uh, new benefits, so no problem. Even if the minimum balance is being uh, made from, uh, you know, 5,000 to 10,000, still no worries because I'm getting lot of advantages. Now, based on this analysis, I may forecast in the coming days if I go with a same uh, program that I am designing a, a account type where the minimum balance is twenty thousand. What is going to be the impact on my on my customer base? Are you getting my point, Ram? What I am saying here? Yes, sir. So this kind of analysis now you tell me why you require Spark? Happily, the analyst is going to work on the historical data and bring the meaningful insights of that one and advise the bank. Now design a bank account like this. Sure, you will be able to retain eighty percent of your customer base. For that sake, tell me why Spark is needed. It is not deadly that I need to develop an account, a new account by tomorrow morning itself, right? That is going to be a, a strategy of the bank, where they lay out, they give a task to the analyst saying, design a unique bank account where the I am able to retain more of the customer's money with less pain to them or easy transition or smooth transition. I give a task to my analyst saying, develop a unique uh, account with uh, Unique features so that if my minimum balance is been doubled, then also I will not be losing my customers. If I ask my analyst to develop that kind of account, they mine all the data, and maybe in a span of two months or three months, they come out with a solution. For that sake, you tell me why I need Spark. Are you getting my point, friends? Here? But in the event of the same bank thing we take, now you did a transaction on your card, a physical, a physical transaction you did on your card, nine uh, thirty in the evening, nine thirty in the evening in uh, India, Bangalore, physically you did a card transaction. Exactly one hour later, ten thirty. Okay, physical transaction is happening in New York. You think is possible? You think is possible? But this is what we call it to be a fraud, and that is how I identify that this is a fraudulent transaction. Fraudulent transaction. One hour before in Bangalore, India, you did a physical transaction with your card at a POS, and one hour later in uh, US, New York, you are again a physical I mean, happening a physical transaction. I understand that something fishy happening. Then. Uh, I should not allow the transaction to happen. Instead, in 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 seconds, you should get a call from the customer care saying, "Are you the same who is doing this transaction or something?" Based on your approval only, it should happen. Otherwise, it needs to be declined. That is one thing. Other thing, last four years, 
your spending potential or spending pattern on the card average you are spending 1000 to 1200 dollars per month that is what you are average spending on the card 1000 to 1200 dollars all of a sudden there is a swipe that is happening for 5000 dollars one single shot then immediately you get a call and for this sake i do the uh, batch processing you think is possible and that is where we need uh, all the customer data and their uh, and their spending pattern also to be available in my memory all the customer data and their spending pattern for the last 2 years or 3 years whatever that also should be available to me in my memory then only i will be able to quickly access that one and uh, decide with with the ai with the basic ai artificial intelligence it should trigger the uh, call center executive or the concerned authorities based on that only the decision needs to be made to make all these things happen in seconds i it is not possible to initiate a map reduce job or a bad job kind of thing or you run a query on hive which takes time till then the transaction you know very well uh, in how many seconds it is been accepted or declined it is not going to be you know it, it is not going to keep you on hold for 10 minutes in few seconds you get a call saying that you know are you sure that you are doing this transaction with your knowledge and you they take all the uh, all the inputs from you whether you are the right person uh, or not and uh, everything is fine then they allow the transaction to happen to make all these things possible i don't think is possible with your um with your uh, uh you know batch processing kind of thing in those cases you require spark kind of thing that is why usually we set up a spark cluster separately usually but nothing wrong nothing wrong that on the same cluster we do it but uh, that resource constraints will be there and uh, you know on the same cluster both map produce and other stuff also needs to run along with your spark definitely it is going to impact that is the reason why usually we set up uh, different clusters for different activities at least at the financial organizations level at the financial organizations level clusters are been set up separately for each individual activity for mortgages and all you have separate because mortgage is also needs to happen right i mean when you are taking some personal loans and all you go to the shop and uh, your personal loan is quickly processed in 5 minutes how come it is possible in 5 minutes your personal loan has been accepted or declined and then they, I mean, they cannot put you on hold if it is something like you know you apply the loan today after one week you come to know uh, by doing all the verifications and all approved or declined that is fine but in 5 minutes quick loan approvals and all how they are happening so each department based on their need they are going to set up their own environments in the background which are going to quickly respond to the queries or the inputs needed contextually i hope now you got the decent understanding of uh, how when where we apply uh, these computing frameworks every 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 computing framework is not suitable for every context it all depends on how uh, you want to leverage your implementations make sense friends yeah i think also one question about uh, yeah uh, so is there a scope for uh, uh, the same to be used on a uh, non hadoop environment too or is it uh, it is only used in the uh, hadoop based uh, uh, environment no it can be done on a stand alone mode also your spark can be executed on stand alone mode even i mean uh, it is not necessary that uh, it must be on hadoop only it can be on uh, different environment that's where it is been mentioned very clearly uh, here i think you notice that you can see spark sql here but other than that you see yes and this this is getting extended time to time and this not been fixed even and this is getting extended the spark is no 
Uh, nothing but the libraries, right? Building the libraries on the Spark core. Like how you have, initially we don't have anything called Spark core and all these things. We have only Spark. Later on when they realize the potential of this one, uh, the RDD concept and how it can be leveraged, now you are getting Spark SQL streaming, MLLib and all. Same like, you know, we have the, uh, we, 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 we may see, I'm not sure, but we may see other libraries also coming up on the same Spark core, um, you know, which can process data from different sources. As of now, you can run Spark using standalone cluster mode on uh, EC2, on Hadoop Yarn, or on Apache. This all is in the context of your data. And you also can access the data in HDFS, Cassandra, HBase, I, Tachyon, and any other Hadoop data source. Any other Hadoop data source. Not only limited to this one, any other Hadoop data source. So it's all li libraries that you are building surrounding this one uh, with which you are reading the data and you know keeping that in memory. Uh, I, I mean, I don't compare these two things exactly same, but I think you heard about SAP HANA. Of course, that is an appliance. It is not uh, just a framework. It is both hardware and software. That is where we call that as a hub. Uh, that is a appliance. It is not uh, like your Spark. But SAP HANA, how it is going to work in the background, even your Spark is going to work in a similar way. It is all the in-memory computing. SAP HANA is also the in-memory computing framework specific in the context of uh, uh, SAP environment, SAP, uh, SAP warehouse, or you call it to be uh, SAP ERP, whatever it is, uh, uh, only pertaining to that one. But they tried their best to make SAP HANA like a Spark, but somehow they were not able to do it. At least as of now, it is only HANA is only on SAP, but they are trying to extend. HANA can be for any kind of uh, in-memory computing. They are trying to make it generic. Um, but I don't know what is the exact status. But when it comes to Spark, it is going uh, towards a generic or generalization. Let the data be anywhere. We should be able to read that and do the processing because uh, where the data has been stored is not the matter to me. Let it be on uh, any storage technique. I should be able to read and it's only one time. All the remaining times, the data is going to live in the main memory and that is being used for processing. So in the coming days, we can see the support to wide varieties of, uh, uh, you know, data storages where you can read and process it. But as of now, they have provided uh, the scope for how you can read from which sources you can read the data and process it, they have given. And this is not limited. This can be extended in the coming days. You, you got the point, uh, Ram? Oh, yes, you know. Thanks for that information. So I know that this is, uh, you know, because Spark itself is a separate program. Uh, we need to, but that program is effective only when uh, people understand the map produced thoroughly because most of the things that you see, I don't know, I don't know how you receive this one, but if you see closely, you have RDD and you have, uh, uh, Varieties of RDDs you have here. I don't know whether you are seeing that here or not. You have JDBC RDD, you have Edge RDD, you have Base uh, R RDD, and uh, same like you have Hadoop RDD also. And uh, using this Hadoop RDD, you are able to perform, using this Hadoop RDD, you are able to perform map, you are able to perform reduce save as sort by and uh, I think you see that here partitioner so using your Hadoop RDD, again, 
There you are calling as the splits. Here we call it as partitions. Here we call it as partition. When we come to MapReduce, we call it as a split. Partition and split, almost the same like. I mean, don't again compare closely. For understanding purpose only that is. Partition and uh, a split are almost same like. Now, how each uh, split is processed by one mapper, each partition is processed by one worker on the running on the uh, on the node so you see this uh, uh, this rdd this is very much similar and close to your MapReduce life cycle only all what you are doing with expensive with expensive code implementation can be very comfortably replaced with uh, uh, with your function calling so knowing all your requirements the library is been pre-built which you can directly use it to get your things done, right? So it has got its own library again, its own frame, I um, mean, uh, its own architecture, how things need to be taken care of here. So I know very well that, you know, in an hour or two, I will not be able to do the entire justification because each and everything needs to be dealt uh, at a precise level to give you, but I, I did my best. I hope I did my best uh, to give you the, big picture of what exactly Spark is and in what way that is related or connected to your uh, your MapReduce kind of thing in the background, right? So, hope you enjoyed and you got some meaningful insights of this one. But anything you feel uh, we are missing, it has not been intentionally missed or something like, it is all because of the limitations in terms of discussing the concepts at large, right? So any questions to me on what we discussed today, friends? Um, no, Shrinivas. This is the last session, Sars? Yeah, hopefully this is the last session. Um, but we continue the practice uh, and you can be in touch with us uh, constantly. As I said, you can be in touch with us constantly. You can, wherever you have questions or uh, you have some issues, you always can uh, directly mail me. That is one, one way you can reach me uh, uh, so that I will be responding. I will be taking the action. May not be, I will be immediately replying you. Uh, if it is needed to reply you immediately, I will be mailing you back. If not, I will be putting something on the blog because the blog is accessible to you all the times. So I think you have, uh, um, you have, uh, uh, you know, um, I think what is that to process the do they do um, whenever there is a change in that particular thing immediately you will be notified so change requests are being enabled uh, on the respect to links I believe I think Sunil and all might have explained you in the beginning of the course that whenever some changes are being done to that particular uh, uh, section of the blog you will automatically get the notification to your mail so um, when you, when you send something to me where I need to immediately respond to your mail, I'll be doing it. If not, I'll take the action in the blog, either directly from my end or from by taking the help of my, my team. I'll be uploading things, what you need in the blog itself. Right? Okay. How long is the videos are available for us, like videos? I think available because time to time, uh, we, we, we change actually. I mean, next batch may not be the same uh, in terms of the content or even in terms of uh, uh, the concepts that I deal because this is one thing I hesitate in my life. I mean, same routine, boring thing again and again. Uh, maybe concepts are going to be the same, but examples we take and all going to be different. So usually we keep those videos, uh, I mean, like that. I mean, uh, at least for next six months, I think they're accessible to you. No problem for that. Okay. Yeah. So it was a wonderful, friends. A good journey with you all these days. You know, making you uh, to get some concepts. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, and uh, hope uh, we did our best. Uh, and we did the justification to your time. I don't uh, bring the commercials into picture. Or at least the time what you have spent with us, hope you have done justification to that. Um, and you feel anything 
that you need to share with us do not hesitate to share either directly with us or even with the team you can reach out to sunil um and please don't hesitate to uh you know talk to the team if you need any support further support or you want to attend some of the sessions in the future you can always reach them and uh, you you can avail those things that should not be a problem at all right so best wishes for your uh, future prospects and uh, the practice the more you practice i think uh, the easy you will be into the uh, same space i think some of you are already uh, uh, closely in touch with the hadoop teams and all working on certain things i think it will be easy for you to uh, switch out to the uh, hadoop technologies as an internal transition but who are uh who are planning to you know enter into the space uh, uh you know attending the interviews and all that is possible only with your practice because uh as this technology is getting matured more more and more the expectations are going high so that is possible only when you do more practice you'll be able to uh, answer most of the queries that you come across in the in the interviews so i advise you to do more practice to gain confidence to clear your interviews uh, to be a part of this space so anything from your end friends uh, thanks a lot uh, srinivas for uh, giving a good foundation and uh, it was like early uh, every day whenever class is there each class like you know it gave us a good insight of uh, the whole technology stack so on day one i remember when we started though we were like confused what are the shadow open our stuff now at least like we have that conference level wonderful uh, ra i appreciate yeah thanks for all your efforts wonderful ra yeah thanks sure. thanks very much uh, it was i think it's yeah it's a good journey even from my end you know you i mean it's not the routine thing from my end i say but yes because it all depends on the participants and their level of interest which, which gives us the energy because the interesting part here is this being online as we are not going to see each other uh, we cannot estimate the emotions or the feelings uh, that all needs to be virtually analyzed so it will be very painful uh especially on the trainer front uh, analyzing all those things and anticipating your queries with one query i should be able to estimate all your next queries and all those needs to be addressed because sometimes you may not be able to uh, bring all those things and you may hesitate i mean keep on asking questions why to irritate let us leave so uh it's definitely a tough thing not only to me to any trainer uh, who do virtually because classroom training is something different we look at your faces and we analyze and understand whether you are happy or not uh, but in this case this is definitely tough but still um, you know we do our own analysis in in estimating uh, you know your level of queries and all and that definitely gives us more energy of course every class uh, you know is important to us but it will be more important if the participants are uh, more interested to learn things and that's where we don't hesitate personally from my end i don't hesitate to share the knowledge because i believe in that concept the more we share the more we gain because now i feel uh, prasad and ram and uh, hemal all of you three has got enough knowledge now definitely a question arises in what way i am better than prasad or ram that makes me to get new stuff and that's how i drain out myself and and I load it again this is what i say the constructive thinking or constructive mentality instead of me hiding something uh, not to be shared with you it is better that i share it with you so that i get the fresh thought saying in what way i am different or i am better than you makes me to get more stuff how you are been benefited out of this is not the botheration to me but by doing this i am been benefited more so i go by that that's the reason why i don't hesitate to share the knowledge though it is very um, painful uh, from our end to spend more man hours in upgrading our skill set 
But when it comes to the sharing, we do it uh, uh, just like that. But that has got its own advantage. And I expect you also to be the same, even at the workplace, uh, with this positive mentality, so that uh, you'll definitely get benefited. And that's the only reason behind my uh, last 20 years journey in the industry to be more successful. I'm very proud to share at least 5,000 of my people are globally on Java and related things and at least a few hundreds in uh, uh, Hadoop space. I don't claim that, you know, I train thousands of people on uh, uh, Hadoop and all. That's all a false thing. Uh, even nobody can claim that. You know very well. But uh, uh, my long journey of uh, more than uh, uh, 18 years in this space, you know, I might have trained at least uh, not less than 5,000 people on Java, classroom, online, uh, and corporate, various modes. And I'm very happy to share, most of them definitely might be excelling in their careers because I, I usually lay the foundation very strong. And that's the core strength. I, I, I advise everyone intend to do similar or better than this so that, you know, uh, the, the benefit can be uh, can be leveraged to the largest society, la largest section of the society, right? So please don't hesitate to share your knowledge, friends. I know by doing this in a longer run, I myself will be killing my business, but business is not the uh, ultimate goal of the life, right? Ultimate goal should be the knowledge sharing. Everyone should get benefited and they should prosper in their own, in their own dimension or direction. So I, I, that is one advice from my end, friends. Please share the knowledge with your colleagues so that they also can be enlightened and in turn can do it. Uh, and this is how we can make uh, a better society. Right? Wonderful, friends. Appreciate your journey with us. i uh, love to see you back in some mode in the coming days with some kind of association. Uh, but please don't hesitate to mail me or you know, call me. Uh, I have my number also been given there. You can always call me on my number or leave a message so that, you know, we can do something constructive in the coming days together. Yes. Wonderful friends. Uh, so, you know, so your contact details you said, like your phone number is shared in the blog somewhere? Sorry. I think not, but you can, uh, I'll, I'm giving in the text here. I mean, uh, both my Indian number and my US number, both I'm sharing here. Sure. Plus 9180196. Double six double nine three six. That is one. That is my Indian number, and my US number is plus one six zero oh three six eight nine nine zero. Oh. One second. Ah, huh? let me one second. Six zero three six eight nine nine zero four five is the thank you this one. This one is one second. Now that mobile number nine zero nine zero seven nine I think. Yeah, it is 9079. 9079. Yeah, yeah I've given both the numbers here, friends. Yeah, you can. Uh, and my mail ID, I think you have with you, techiebees at chinoas. Sorry, uh, chinoas at techiebees.com. You can uh, send a mail to me on that anytime. And depending on your query or your uh, your uh, your problem, I'll respond to the mail or I'll uh, take an action on the blog. Right? Sure. Yeah. Wonderful, friends. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Arjuna. Wonderful. Love to see you back in some form in the coming days. Sure. Looking forward to same year. Great.